Well, my name is Sam Walter. It's Samantha. Somebody called me out and said, oh, that sounds like a man's name. Yes. Once when I was, um, I actually got assigned a, dor a, a dorm room in the men's dorm, and I was like, yes. And they said, oh, wait a minute. That doesn't work, does it? No, no, not so much. So um, that was a little interesting. I've been working with Pathfinders, and I'm always confused. Um, I don't know if this is year 21 or 22, but um, it's, it's a lot. Um, there are people that have been doing it a lot longer than I have, but um, I've been privileged to um, be involved for quite a while. Um, I didn't have the opportunity to do Pathfinders as a kid, except one year, and I really wasn't the proper age. Uh, you know, we start with fifth grade and go through um, our 12th grade kids, and I was in a very tiny little church um, that had a few kids, and they didn't have enough that were proper age, and there were probably eight of us that were fourth graders, and they said, you guys come too. So my introduction to Pathfinders was as a friend, but not, I shouldn't have been a friend. They took us on a backpack trip. This is the only thing I remember from this, this whole year. They took us on a backpack trip, and of course I don't think they gave us good instructions as to how our pack should be packed and what size it was, because my backpack stood this much taller than me. Um, and it was heavy, and we went to Natural Bridge, Kentucky, in the winter time and in the middle of the night my tent mate and I were just freezing and we kept waking up and putting on more clothes you know more socks more pants more shirts our jackets our hats by the morning we both had on every piece of clothing we had we stumbled out and there was this much snow on the ground and we were like oh so the temperatures dropped and had, you know gotten snowy so we got ourselves all you know breakfast and all that good thing worship and um, I don't know what we did for the day, but I do remember the hike out. And on the hike out, we're hiking along, and there are some low tree branches. And yes, you can imagine a tree branch caught my pack, because remember, my pack is taller than I am, and it just flipped me right on my back. Well, since I was already struggling with a heavy pack, um, I was at the back, and there wasn't anybody behind me. And I am on my back, and I cannot get up. I can't turn because my pack's heavier than I am. I can't get up, and I'm yelling, somebody help me! I was like a little stranded turtle. So to this day, I'm not a fan of backpacking. <laughs> um, so, you know, when, when um, my club would go backpacking, I had people for that. So that um, was kind of my introduction to Pathfinders. Um, when I lived in Florida, I was in Florida for um, a couple of years teaching, and I worked with a club. I was a counselor um, with a club in Florida. Um, so that was my introduction to being staff. Um, I don't remember a whole lot of staff training that we went through. I was just kind of thrown in, um, and it was interesting because I do remember a camp out where we had a huge tent, and I think there were 12 or 15 girls in the tent with me. That was an interesting, you know, evening, but eh, it worked out. So then um, journeyed on in life, and with my husband and I had children, fifth grade age, you know, we knew we wanted our son to be a Pathfinder, um, and so we joined a Pathfinder club. So for the first six years, I really was not an official anything. I didn't, I wasn't a counselor. Um, I was just there. <laughs> I did, you know, I was kind of the, and I really was trying to think about those years. What did I do? I wasn't a counselor because I deal with children all day, every day, and that was enough for me. As a classroom teacher, I was like, okay, I can't do it all evening too. Um, I think I cooked. I think I maybe did secretarial things. I don't remember if I had really a title. One year I had, for me, um, the worst title in the world, and it was deputy director. I looked at my director at the end of that year and said, don't ever ask me to do that again. And she's like, why? Mm. And I don't know if it was just my director, um, but I hated it because I had this assumed authority by everyone else, but I couldn't tell, you know, it was just like, well, you're the deputy director. Yeah, but you have to ask her. That's the way she worked. And so I was like, please don't ask me to do that ever again. I hated that position. Um, it works out for a lot of clubs. So, yeah, yeah, I mean, it works out for a lot of clubs, but it's, it depends on, but you have to be able to work together. <laughs> Um, and to figure out that relationship. Didn't work for us. Um, so time kind of went on um, with that, and then I was asked to be the director, and I thought, okay, how many times have I missed a Pathfinder meeting in the last six years? Okay, let me think. Um, you know, so I mean, I was always there. Um, I had watched everybody do all of the things they were supposed to do, and they asked me to be the director, 
And I said, sure, why not? And so um, I was the director at College Dale for eight years. <laughs> and um, we took 149 kids to Oshkosh as I was coming in. My first official act as director was taking 149 kids or people to Oshkosh. It was great fun. Um, so it worked out really, you know, I mean, we had a great, a great ride. My husband and I enjoyed um, Pathfinders very much. Um, our children got out of Pathfindering. And yet here we are still. Um, Pathfinder gets in your blood, doesn't it? And you just, it is just um, what you do. So a lot of you in this room um, have done Pathfinders because I recognize faces for a while. Um, a lot of you are new to Pathfindering. So the first thing I'm going to ask you to do is on the back of that blue sheet, I, I want you to think about um, if you're going to organize a Pathfinder club from the ground up. There's not a club in your church. Um, and there's maybe a couple of you in this room who are in that position. There's not, um, there's not a club. What's the steps? What do you do to organize a Pathfinder club? So take a few minutes and just jot down. What do you think the first, you know, maybe five or six steps are? Thank you. It should have been in your chair. It blew away. Well, there, Sheila's hogging them all. This is, no, this is, it's ground up. What you going to do? What are the steps you need to do to organize a Pathfinder Club? There's one for each of you. And the answers are not on this handout, by the way. <laughs> Holly. I'm not sure that I'm going to have enough, guys. So maybe, I was going to say, let me, yeah, let's, yeah, because I'm, I'm, all right, don't write on them until we find out, okay? <laughs> I may have shorted you one anyway. Are you sure? Because we could just do one. Well, let me, let me find out how we go, and if I need you to, maybe the stack will last longer than I think. But it's feeling like it's getting thin fast. Thank you, darling. Yeah. Yeah, because you might need to. And then this, this is, as, okay. And then you guys can, those are the last of them. All right, so what do you think? What do you think are some of the first things you need to do? Check for interest. Check for interest. Board approval. Speak to the pastor of the church. Speak to the pastor of the church. A team? Decide what? Decide why you want to do it. Decide why you want to do it? Seek guidance from established clubs. Okay, seek guidance from established clubs. What else? Yes. Talk to parents, social parents and kids. Okay. Talk to parents. See who's the social parents. The parents who are busy doing stuff. Gotcha. Okay. Apply with the conference. Apply with the conference? What a novel idea. Board member and apply with the conference. Yeah, You're right. You've been there, done that, right? Okay. Maybe not in that order, but yeah. Okay. <laughs> because, go ahead. I think you need to pray about it. Yes. It's a big thing. It is a big thing. Big thing. It's a big thing. Okay, so there's one extra handout. Anybody? Okay. All right, there are a number of, of steps um, that you do need to do, and often I think um, we get ahead of ourselves when we want to, we just, because we have this passion for young people, um, we want to do a club, we get gung-ho, and we are off and running, and we forget that there are some, um, there, there are some appropriate political, if you want to say political, you know, 
things that organizational things that you need to do. You do have to have um, proper backing from your church and your church board. Uh, you do need to apply with the conference and be conference recognized. So there are, there are some steps that you have to do. It's not um, as simple as just starting up a club and working with, with kids. Um, why is it important to make sure that you are board approved and conference approved? Insurance, Insurance reasons? Funding. Funding? A big L. Liability. You want to make sure because if you're going through the proper channels, you are proper, your people should be properly vetted. You know what that means, properly vetted? Because, mm -hmm. um, guys, in the day and times in which we live, rightfully so, because it's our job to protect our young people. So rightfully so, we want to make sure that the people that are working with our children, our youth, um, are, are properly vetted. So it's important that we have all of those pieces in place for us. Um, when you look at the handout, and I'm just going to tell you right now, basic staff training, there is a manual. It is online. Advent Source has put a lot of these manuals online. If you search for it, um, there's a basic staff training manual online. And when I look at everything that is in that list, there is no way that we can cover an hour's, um, in an hour um, what we, yeah, if you can just go ahead and pull that out. I'm not sure why that row is there, but um, if you will um, just know that I'm going to kind of go through some of the highlights do the best I can with those, but the basic staff training manual is online. Okay, the Pathfinder flow chart, when you look at this, and of course, um, on your chart, it's blank. So really, you've got uh, your general conference Pathfinder director um, is kind of really, he's the top, um, the division director. Who's the division director? That would be North American division, right? Who's our division director? I can go to the union director. <laughs> I know that one. Do you guys know who the union director is? First of all, do you know what union you're in? Southern. Southern Union. All right. Well, there you know. We went to Clockwell last year. We did, if you were a part of it. So the union director is who? He's here today. Who's the Southern Union Pathfinder director? Ken Rogers. Yeah, Ken Rogers. Local conference director. What's your conference? Of course, you know that you are Georgia Cumberland. Who's your local conference? Fernando. Fernando. Verdusco, area coordinators, I'm one of them, you know, um, so he'll have us up there in a, um, we've been given strict instructions, were you here last night? We've been given strict instructions to line up and order, somebody help us, so anyway, your church board, do you know who your church board um, chair is? Because that's important, you need to know who's your church board, and then your club director, that's kind of the flow chart for that. All right, so when you're organizing a Pathfinder club, um, you do want to um, seek some counsel with your youth director, your area coordinators, uh, meet with your pastor, uh, maybe even have them meet with um, either the, uh, an area coordinator or the youth. You've got to present the plan to the church board. So, you know, once you start that seeking counsel and meeting with people, present that plan to the church board and then inform the congregation, you know, during a worship service. Hey, this is kind of what we're thinking about doing. Um, you're also going to want to have a special meeting on a Sabbath afternoon. Um, why would you do that on Sabbath afternoon, a special meeting? Yep, you, you've got to find out who else is interested because you can't do it alone. You've got to find out who else, who's your core group of people going to be. Begin to teach some of the basics of pathfindering. Elect your director and your deputy directors. Um, obviously, depending on the size of your club, you may not have deputy directors. It may be you know, a director and you are also the counselor and then you've got someone else who's the cook. You know, so it just depends on the size. Um, you can choose then your counselors and your instructors. Um, that's important to do before you begin to do these next steps. Um, you know, when they talk about calling that Pathfinder Executive Committee, who are they talking about? Is it um, the, the, the Pathfinder? It's your people. Yeah, it's your people. It's your, your staff, your group. Um, and you really want to build the program six weeks before enrollment night, before you have that registration night. You really got to start working to build the process. Um, and it is, it is a process. You got to train and uniform your staff before enrollment night. Um, and then have, and of course, most of us, I think, call our enrollment night registration, um, you know, when you have registration. Why, why might you want your staff in uniform? At registration? 
To be identified, yes. So that people know who they're talking to and with. Well, a home. It also shows commitment. It does show commitment. You are right. Um, home visitation program, what's that all about? Getting your children involved, yeah. Finding out, you know, visiting those families, seeing if you can draw them in. Um, because I think a lot of families, if they're not, if Pathfindering hasn't been um, in their area, if it's, you've not had it at your church, um, we like to know what's in it for me. Um, don't we? Okay, so why would I want to do this? What's the point? Um, so have that little, th that visit. Keep it brief, though. Um, you're going to have to, you want to have an induction program a month or two after enrollment night. Um, you're, that's your, um, your program that really um, gets people and your kids their end then because you induct them into the club. Anybody not seen an induction before? Okay. All right. Um, how, some of you want to talk about what you've done for induction. We've got two people that have never seen one. What do you do? Holly, what do you do? Okay. Uh, at night, we have, so it, you know the candles are really light up in the camping. We make it part of the, our Christmas. Right? That's interesting. I have never, never thought of doing induction at camp at a camp out. I yeah. I take a, a, a long flower pot with sand in it and put the candles in that. Okay. And yeah, because the induction is quite symbolic, you know, with your candles and yeah. you know you've got all the different candles that represent the pieces of uh, the emblem and uh, the each club. And you do you do start in total darkness if you read the script, <laughs> um, yeah. But I've never thought about doing it. Anybody else do it in a very different kind of venue? Church service. We do church service. Church yeah. service. Mm -hmm. Basically. Okay. Yes. You know, and if you're able to do that, that's really if what as much of pathfindering as you can put in front of your church body, um, that's you know that's really phenomenal. If you are in a large church. Um, like I was, it was really hard for us to be able to do things in front of the whole church body um, because, you know, we were university campus and we competed with everybody. But, yes, as much as you can get them in front of the church. Um, a guest night, what might a guest night? Did you ever do a guest night within your club, those of you that have had clubs? That's when you invite your, um, have your Pathfinders bring a guest, you know, bring a friend. Um, and, again, you know, that can be tricky um, just depending on your area. You know, if everybody, if, if you live, you know, where I did, it was hard for us to have kids because all their friends, if they weren't at our club, they were in somebody else's club. So we didn't do that. That was kind of hard. And then you, of course, have your um, club meeting. I should have brought my little clicker. I'm sorry. I keep stepping in front. Pathfinder on three levels, I think everybody is pretty much familiar with those. Um, I, I struggle with the ages, the age bracket there because you know my, well, I shouldn't say you know, but I'm going to tell you. My philosophy is I keep them as long as I can. Um, you know, so I don't, I don't stop at 15. I kind of go to that 18 thing. Um, when they hit 18, they do have to go ahead and go through the screening um, because they are, um, in the eyes of the law, they're legal adults at 18. So they do have to go through that training. Um, and often you're, you know, they'll turn 18 during their senior year. You know, so if they're working as a TLT, um, you know, but you, you know, keeping our young people involved, I have, I've heard lots of, lots of people st say, I stayed in the church because of Pathfinders. I've not heard them say, well, you know, I was on the track team at my Adventist high school when I stayed in, in church because I was on the track team. You know, I've never quite heard that. But um, keeping them involved, giving them a purpose. So I prefer 18. Do you have a question? If one turns 18 in the middle of the season, they, still, they have to fill it out? They have to fill it out when they turn 18, yes. Okay, kind of the, you know, within. Um, and I know, de again, depending on the size of your club, this is a little tricky. But, uh, you know, your committees, you can have um, a coordinating committee your executive committee, and your general staff. Again, if you're a small club, you are all of those. You know, you are all of those. Um, so it just depends. Okay. All right, we do have two then. Um, so it just does depend on um, the size of your, your club for sure. Any questions about those? I think they're kind of self-explanatory. Um, anybody 
big enough that you want to separate your clubs into a junior club and a teen club? No church is big enough? College was big enough, and my philosophy was not to, um, because I felt like that I wanted my teens to model for my juniors. I wanted my teens to begin to train and work with my juniors. I wanted my teens to teach honors with my juniors. I wanted my teens to have a purpose. I didn't make them staff. I didn't call them, you know, junior staff because especially if they're, well, even, even at 18, it's still tricky. But they should not have the responsibilities um, as a young person to supervise another young person. Even if there's a, a several year gap, they are still a young person. And as adults, that's our role. They can come alongside us, but we should not put them in a position um, to be a leader uh, in a way over other children that they are not, um, it's not appropriate for them. But um, that's kind of my own personal little bandwagon, but it made sense for me. So if you're going to split them up, you've got some different roles that you can have with that. Um, a certificate of operation. And I know we keep saying, we've got to do this. And we do it one year, we get those, we get them out and, and um, we do well. And, and then um, it kind of, you know, with all of the other administrative things we do, we don't get up and running with that. But there is actually a nice little certificate operation. Of course, a lot of clubs say, well, now what am I supposed to do with this? So, um, but once you've got met the approval from all of those organizations, your, your church board, um, they voted you in, you got your club organized, and you're, you have registered with the conference, then you are an official club ready to roll. Club membership and attendance, and I think I'm preaching to the choir. I think you guys know these things. Um, but, you know, this, this material came from, um, I'm drawing a blank, from somewhere else. But anyway, so I copied and pasted. <laughs> but they say the youth at 10 years of age, in Georgia Cumberland, we don't go by age, we go by grade level. And so they are fifth grade. Um, so you do want them to, to have membership application forms. You want them to pay membership and insurance fees if you pass those on to your, to your kids. Um, you know, if, you've, if you have a dues. Um, every Pathfinder should have and regularly wear the complete Pathfinder dress uniform and a club field uniform where applicable. Members must be faithful in attendance. We're going to get to the uniform. We'll come back to that for a minute. We'll talk about why to wear that. But um, with dues, what do you guys think about this membership? Yes. I have a question. Sure. Does the Pathfinder Club have to carry insurance apart from what the church already carries? Um, the Pathfinder Club carries insurance through, um, through the conference. When you are when you are registering, you get all of that information, um, and it. Okay, there's there's probably an insurance thing. You know, when you register, um, and you re that's one of the reasons you register your Pathfinders because you're a conference thing. It's one of the reasons that they have to be registered online, um, is to be covered under conference insurance. So if you're registering your kids online, um, and you're getting them in there and they're appropriately approved, then they're covered. Okay. Cause I just had yeah. That. Yes. Guys, okay, the question was, you know, what are reasonable fees and how do you handle, you know, families that can't afford it? You know, I can tell you what we did, and it's going to vary from club to club. I know what we did. Um, we had, we did not do a registration fee. I hope, I'm, I hope I'm saying that right. I don't think we did. They did purchase uniforms because we had them to purchase their own, own uniforms. And you guys know uniforms are expensive. And so that was kind of the registration fee. And if they're buying a uniform... They're buying in, you know, they are. Um, we charged um, juniors $25 a month. That was their dues, $25 a month. And then we charged, I know you raised your eyebrows, but hang on just a minute. And we charged our teens $30 a month. Um, but here's the, here's the thing. When it came time for a camp out, there was not a camp out fee. When it came time for um, an honor, there was not a fee for honors. I mean, we did, we all encompassing everything with that. Um, we were fortunate enough to have people in the church 
who every year faithfully would sponsor children. And so there were people that, um, you know, if they couldn't come, we didn't stop them because we did have those people in the church faithfully. Uh, you know, I, one lady would come to me every year and she'd say, now, you know, I'm going to, yes, ma'am, I do know. Because her daughter um, had leukemia and died as a young, a young person. And in her last days when she knew none of them, she didn't know any of them. She didn't recognize them. She talked, gives me goosebumps. She talked about her pathfinders you know, her as a kid. She talked about her campouts. She talked about her experiences, even though she didn't recognize her own mom and dad. Pathfinding was ingrained in her. And so her parents will forever, as long as they're alive, they will sponsor Pathfinders. You know, now their stories may not be that <laughs> traumatic, but you always have someone in the church who will sponsor them. Um, I do know that there are some clubs who don't charge dues, but then when a field, tri a field trip, when a uh, camp out comes around, it might be $75 or $55. For us, we just felt like a set fee every month um, was easier for families to budget than to say, okay, now this, this trip, because it's a little further away, is gonna be $57. The next trip you had, it might be 12 because of what you're doing. So we just felt like a, a, you know, a straight fee. And then if you've got a teen coming to teen events, and now juniors, if you've got those junior events, those are pricey. We never, we never upcharge them. If, you know, because if it's a $55 event for the conference, they still paid their $30 a month because it, it came out in the wash, so to speak. Okay. All right. Let's, um, Thank you. yes, ma'am. All right. Um, learning the, the pledge and law. Um, pathfinders have to agree to, to buy in and to participate and to be there. You got to have those pathfinders, uh, their parents on board with you. Uh, your staff members, you know, are all there. Um, we are expected to be pathfinders, right? Um, and do the right thing. More with this, club members willing to participate in projects, um, uh, whatever you're doing. So really getting that full buy-in. We are going to be a club and do what we need to do. All right, we're getting into some of the policies then, uniforms, finance, reporting, insurance, and membership regulations. We've talked about several of those already. But... Um, you guys know when we when should we wear our uniforms? When? Once a month. No. <laughs> Beyond once a month. I mean, you know what else? I'm sorry. Oh yeah, Pathfinder Bible Experience induction. Anytime you're doing something with your inside your church for church service. Yep. Any mm -hmm. inside church? Any anything you're doing there? What else? Campery. Campery. Camp collecting or whatever you do for. Yes, outreach. Mm-hmm. When should you not wear your uniforms? Camping. Camping. Mechanic honor. Mechanic honor, yes. When you're out doing your good deed for someone else. Yeah, when you're out doing a good deed. You don't necessarily, individually. Indiv oh, individually. That's yeah, true, yeah. When you're on your own time, doing when you're your on personal, your, stuff, mm -hmm. personal business, personal yes. purchases somewhere, you should yes. not be wearing Yes. Yeah, but should you do a food drive in your class season? Should you do a food drive in your class A? As a club, yes. As a club. Uh, mm-hmm. Okay. Um, the purpose of it, obviously, purpose of your uniform is, is loyalty. One of the things, those of us that, and I didn't get to go on the, and didn't get to go to Mongolia this time. I went two years ago when we went. Um, my husband went this time. But one of the things that struck us then and, and the team that went this year, you know, when you put a uniform on, um, a Mongolian young person and their pathfinders are mostly teens they are excited and they are proud um, and we struggle with that we struggle with you know kids wanting to wear their uniform um, but to be you know and to to do that as a witness so there's some good reasons that we do wear you know those like we talked about the special programs like Pathfinder Sabbath and induction and investiture and campery we've mentioned those public gatherings you know, if you're going to be an usher for something, if you're going to be a guard of honor, um, missionary activities, so, you know, the, the distribution of literature, um, food basket, which, you know, we talked about that as well. If you're going to visit the sick and shut-ins, going to a nursing home, it's good to have on, you know, that uniform. Um, on any occasions that the club leader and the conference officials say wear your uniform, and yes... <laughs> Pastor, you know, Pastor Fernando did ask us to wear them today. I apologize to him already. 
Um, when should we not wear the uniforms? If we're engaged in selling, um, and I think that's, you know, um, and because and and sometimes we do fundraisers, and so I think, okay, does that mean when we're doing a fundraiser? Um, ah, for personal profit. <laughs> or political purposes. You know, um, when the wearing of it discounts the organization and kind of lowers the dignity and the esteem, it makes it commonplace. So looking at the uniform, you guys, I don't have to show you the uniform, you've got it on. You know, you know what the, the boys' uniform is, what the girls' uniform should be. Um, you know, we often, you know, this says black skirt, and often we, um, there are some clubs who are very dedicated to skirts for, for the girls and the women, and there are others who say, I'm putting everybody in pants um, because of um, either personal, um, personal reasons or the way that um, just what's appropriate for the culture of their church. Of course, you know about the accessories what you should have there. It's kind of what they look like. I'm going to, what the staff uniform, I'm going to flip through these. But this is all a part of, if there's anything that you have there. There, This, um, I think sometimes we get confused as to where the patches and the pins and all that stuff goes. So you've got kind of some little pictures here to help with that. Um, oh, and the measurings, I like that too. They give you the exact measurements for where the things go, and boy, I am not a seamstress. I always have to get someone to do that for me, because I'm like, I cannot. Try not to have your Pathfinders staple, because, you know, it's always, you know, it, it never fails. You have someone that comes to induction, and their, and their patches are stapled, and I mean, and they're, they're stapled on their shirts, and you just kind of chuckle. I have a Pathfinder who, bless her heart, um, she was my Pathfinder from fifth grade all the way through. She's been staff um, for probably two or three years now, um, still at College Dale. But as a fifth grader, they and she had earned a lot of honors that year. And when they got, she and her mom got, I'm sorry to chuckle, they got the sash all done. It was backwards. So the sash was backwards. And so she wore it backwards for a while. I was like, okay, you really have got to get that turned. So they, ver they, they got new patches. They were very careful. <laughs> it was backwards again. I was like, oh, my word, it's still backwards. So, I, I, you know, when I see her now, she doesn't even have a sash on. So I'm just like, okay, she has two backwards sashes. Um, uh, this is a question that often comes up about the chevrons. Um, so, you know, what do we do with our chevrons? Um, and I think there are... You know, once you become a master guide, if you've gone through all of them, then your star patch can be the ones with all the multiple colored chevrons on it. Um, but if you are, somebody got one on? Oh, they're just looking at the chevrons. So, oh, yeah, there you go. Or if you don't have all of the classes, because remember, I was only ever a friend, so I just have, you know, the star, not the fancy one. Again, I think we talked about this already. Um, you know, when this says club dues are required, I really think that is, that's club to club. You know, what your church board says and what you guys are doing. I, you know, when this says they're required, um, when we talk about fundraising, we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit too because, you know, not every, not every club does fundraising. Some has to do, you know, some clubs have to do more. But the one thing you do need to do is have that financial report. You've really got to have, because I'm going to tell you, there is nothing that will get a club or an individual into trouble faster than misappropriation, mishandling of funds that belong to someone else. So make sure that your club treasurer, um, whoever's handling the money, if it's you, um, that you've got lots of checks and balances in place. Um, because I tell people all the time, okay, I, I have a bookkeeper. <laughs> um, I have people because I don't look good in orange, you know, so I don't know if they still put orange jumpsuits on people, but just keep me out of jail. Your monthly reporting, and I know this is, um, as we do this monthly reporting, it's online, um, and those need to be submitted. You know, um, when it talks about keeping your area coordinators informed about your club activities, you know, it is, it is nice, and um, if you let them know, let us know, um, because we do occasionally try to drop into things that you guys are doing, um, just as a support for you, just to kind of help you out, um, you know, just to see uh, if there's something we can do for you. We're never there 
to do an inspection as a aha, let's see if you're doing it right. Let me catch you. That's never it. We just want to come and be a support to you, but feel free to invite us. Um, again, and I think this is something that, um, you know, make sure when you've got those people that are faithful, you know, um, faithful to sponsor your Pathfinders, um, make sure that you do give them that periodic, you know, little word of thanks so that they know that you do appreciate them. Um, your insurance, of course, you guys know that we are, uh, once you register, then we're under that. We're talking about, you know, the protection. Um, I know that when you do health and medicals, and I don't think it's in this PowerPoint, if I get to it later, I, I apologize. With your health and medicals, I always had my staff fill out a health and medical form as well. Um, because if you don't, if you're on a camp out and they fall out, why did they fall out? Are they allergic to? Who's, who, are you, who should you call? And I think sometimes as adults, we just think, oh, well, you know, we'll, we'll take care of ourselves. Not if you're unconscious, you can't take care of yourself. So always make sure that you get proper forms on your staff as well um, because you need to make sure that everybody is taken care of, getting all those forms filled out for everyone in your club. And then make sure that you guys really think, um, and you've, I, hopefully you've got someone in your club who is observant enough to look around and say, okay, that's not a good idea. Um, <laughs> okay, you should stop doing that before you hurt yourself. Um, I don't, and I'm, I'm sorry, men, but it's always, it's always a man who says, hey, watch this, and it turns out badly. <laughs> um, so there's got to be a level-headed um, person, we'll just put it that way, <laughs> um, you know, to really take care of. So somebody's got to watch out for those hazards. Um, again, your field trips, uh, and I'm sorry, you can tell I'm in school all day. Um, the things you do, yeah, I guess they're called field trips. Whatever you do, make sure that you have all your forms ready in case of emergency. Don't go anywhere. Yeah, they're even using the word field trip. Um, don't take kids any place without that signed permission slip from a parent. Um, with the medical release, got to make sure that you supervise kids. Uh, you have to do your due diligence. You have to be able to prove that you, because you can watch a kid fall, but you better be there watching them. You know, maybe not catching them, but you, you should not be off doing something else when they are, you know, hurting themselves. Don't leave kids unsupervised. So um, it's that proper supervision, making sure that you're doing your due diligence. Um, okay, your permission slips are for anything that is off campus of where you regularly meet. And no, they need to be spit specific to each event yes you could have all of the permission slips for the year there to sign a registration if you have all of the permission slips there <laughs> for them to sign at the beginning of the year you are way more organized than we ever were I'm just saying. yeah you would be on the ball if you did that yeah but the you run the risk there of them not remembering what you're doing you know so you really need those need to go kind of as you're preparing for your event um, again, you guys know about, you know, regulations of, you know, we've kind of looked at that. It's just, we're running out of time here. Um, guys, you know, um, and of course, so we've talked about those, any variation of rules and regulations, um, you know, the club have to be approved by your executive council and then the church board. You know, the one thing with any of your trips, anything that you do, you want to make sure that your church board, it needs to be on the church's calendar. If your events are not on the church's calendar, it's not an official event. I do know that this happened several years ago. There was a group of young people that, um, they were all Pathfinder people. Um, it was a Sabbath afternoon. The families were friends. The families got together. Um, it was not, it had not been advertised as a Pathfinder event because the club wasn't there, but the families that were there were Pathfinder involved and Pathfinder, you know, children. Well, something happened and they attempted to turn it in for Pathfinder insurance. Well, the church board said, this wasn't a Pathfinder event. And the other staff members said, well, if it was a Pathfinder event, why wasn't I invited? So you really need to make sure that you get all of, uh, you know, everything on the calendar for that. Um, within this, and I'm going to jump back to um, the description here. It talks about uh, that in this session, we'll talk about the description of um, each of the roles of your staff and we didn't really get into that it is in the basic staff training manual that you can find online 
um, and they give you kind of that outline of what happens. But guys, as we all know, it depends on the size of your club. Um, it depends on if there are two people and three kids, you know, then you're wearing multiple hats. Um, if you're a club that you have 14 staff members and 30 kids, you know, I mean, it just, it depends. But um, go ahead, you can Google the, um, the, and I put in Pathfinder, I think I put Bath Pathfinder Basic Staff Training Manual, um, and you can, you can find it. It's all there, downloadable. Um, you can save it. You know, we used to just have to purchase everything from Advent Source, but they are really fabulous now that most of those documents are online and are downloadable. I don't know. I Googled it. <laughs> just, just Google the document and it'll, um, it will come up. Who asked that question? Yeah. Um, a lot of it you can get to from, from Pathfinders Online, um, but I always just, Google is my friend. What did we do before Google? I don't know. But anyway. Library, yes. That was a really quick, you know, run through of broad kinds of things um, because, I, you, like I said, you can't cover the whole section in, in just an hour. But what questions do you have still about organizing a club? No, there is actually a secretary and there's a deputy director. Um, well, let's. I, I thought perhaps it's, someone it's might the, ask uh, that question. Pretty much the deputy director does everything to run the club. The director just supervises everything. Yeah. According to the Pathfinder so, manual, that's, that's pretty, pretty much, much it. So, <laughs> well, if you look right here, okay, so here it is. We do have a few more minutes. So, you know, it talks about um, the club director. And I, I, want you to, I want you to read the first line because, in my opinion, it might disqualify some of us. The Pathfinder Club Director should be a mature person. Okay, well that, you know, stop right there. There went that one, no. Um, you know, but you do need to be a mature person who is, and I think that means adult, not, you know, grown up. Um, a, a church member, good and regular standing. Uh, it says they, that he or she should be a master guide. Well, I wasn't a master guide. I got that way down the road, you know. Um, if you have a master guide, sure. But I, I don't know that it's, you know, has to be. Um, it talks about, then let me scroll on down a little bit here. They um, said at the bottom, if they're not a master guide, they should be one as soon as possible. Yes. So here's the, the director's duties. Did you know you should be a member of the church board? Yes. Yes. And there are a lot of, a lot of um, churches who, I don't know, they don't invite you or don't tell you or... I, you just kind of have to say, um, I should be a part of this. Um, you know, you are, the, you, they didn't give you a choice, huh? Yeah. Um, you do need to, again, stay in touch with the church pastor, your youth pastor. Um, you chair the, you know, your executive committee, you know, your staff meetings. You lead in planning. You supervise all activities. Um, you know, so you really are setting kind of the tone for the club, making sure that everybody is there doing what they should be, basically. You are in charge, in other words. Um, the deputy, yeah, the deputy director um, does whatever the director tells them to do. Well, kind of, sort of. I don't think it says that exactly. Um, but they, well, it does say a deputy director designated by the director takes charge of the club meetings in the absence of the director. So basically, you do step up. If the director's not there, you step up. Um, you know, so it can be any of these things. Um, you, you look out for the Pathfinder classes. Um, secretary, tra it, it's everything. Say what? Yes. Yes. I'm sorry, I was looking for who was speaking and it was okay. You had a question? Yeah, real quick. Um, I've heard conflicting uh, opinions on this, but when you are director of the Pathfinder Club, is it an automatic board position or is it subjective? According to policy, it's, it's, it is, yes. You should be a part of the. Because you have to yeah. let the church board know what's going on in your club. Yeah. Because, well, remember, because the, the, board, the board has to approve, they have to approve your outings. It has to be on the calendar um, for insurance to cover it. So, yes, you should be, you should be a board member. 
the club secretary, and, and like I said, guys, this, and pardon me as I lean over, you know, the club secretary, this really depends on, because I can't see it from that side. Um, club secretary, um, you know, keeps all those records. They collect the dues. They make sure that they're turning in who's there and what uniform they were wearing. And, you know, I mean, there's a lot of things. But, but then, again, some directors wear all of these hats. Because, Sheila, how many, how many staff do you have? Are you still a director? Yeah. And, and Sheila has two staff members, so Sheila wears all of these hats. You're what? I'm one of the staff. Yeah. Yeah. You know, so there can be a club treasurer. Um, and, guys, whether you have a club treasurer or you're handling the money, you, that's, that is one area that you really, really need to make sure that you have someone else doing checks and balances with you. Um, you want to, if you are collecting dues and you're collecting cash, you need to be giving a receipt. You need to give a receipt to that parent. You need to make sure that you log it. You, the, you need to find out from your church board how, you want those, how they want the funds handled um, because, like I said, there is nothing that will get you into trouble faster than misappropriating money. For somebody to say, so, okay, we paid all these dues. What, what, you know, don't take kids on. You know, make sure you keep yourself um, safe with this one. So, you know, but again, you can have a club chaplain. Um, I tried to um, always get my youth, the youth pastor, uh, to buy in and to be and to come and do worships with us. Uh, and, and I was very fortunate. I had a couple of years where I had, you know, a youth pastor. He'd come every Wednesday evening because we met on Wednesdays. He would do worship for a little bit. but it was gr and, and then we got him to go on, on campouts too because what's the role of the youth pastor? To pastor the youth, right? And where are the youth? At Pathfinders. So it was awesome. It was perfect. Um, so everything is here, um, unit counselors, what their role is, a junior counselor. I'm going to tell you, if you have junior counselors, they should always work under the supervision of an adult. They should never have a unit by themselves, never, ever, 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 um, because it, it is your responsibility as the adult. Um, they are still young people. Don't put them in a position that they are not ready to handle. Any other questions? Kind of what your instructor, I mean, it's all here. We could spend hours talking about building a staff, uh, organizing a club.